Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. I've long been interested in examining peer review, which has been established to ensure quality and accuracy of academic research and publications. This has been the credibility maker of ideas, inventions, and new paradigms in both trade and journal publications. Peer review ensures that an article and therefore the journal and the scholarship of the discipline as a whole maintains a high standard of quality, accuracy, and academic integrity. This is what it's known for. When you consult peer-reviewed sources, you're tapping into a wealth of established, verified knowledge. But does this mean that non-peer-reviewed materials have no value? What happens if academics refuse to peer review? Are they the only arbiters of quality and accuracy? Few people outside of academia know what peer review is and how it operates. And like most ideas and methods, peer review has evolved from its original purpose in ways that many academics never anticipated. Some of these were part of the scandals involving climate science and the perversion of the scientific and the academic method. In fact, it's become an incestuous system that often invites corruption and territoriality so that new discoveries cannot make their way to the world. Peer review is seen by some as antithetical to innovation and perpetuates prevailing wisdoms. We need a new and better process and paradigm because of the hugely important implications for the betterment of all society. And with us today is Gavin Menzies, the author of the blockbuster 1421 and 1434, and Dr. Tim Ball, a climatologist, educator, environmentalist, and writer from Canada who joins us today to lay out what we need to know about peer review, their thoughts and experiences with it. Gentlemen, thank you for being here today. Welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. Well, thank you very much for inviting us, me. All right, Dr. Tim Ball, explain in your longstanding experience inside academia, what is peer review, how did it get started, and how is it used? And then, Gavin, I want to call upon you to add to this. Thank you. Well, I, I think that um, the uh, it's like with so many things, they start as a, a fundamental idea with a, with a specific purpose, and uh, that gets perverted over time. And uh, and of course, as with anything, uh, can be used for good or evil. And uh, peer review was the idea that uh, you could um, uh, use the uh, knowledge and uh, experience of uh, people in a particular area to uh, determine whether you're ideas and, and research was uh, had some validity to it um, and um, in, in fact just to uh, illustrate uh, the idea I practiced and I'm not ashamed of this of, of I would write an article and, and be uh, somewhat uh, have trepidations about it and I would send it to a, a journal for review in order to get the feedback from people that I couldn't normally contact and um, and of course it, it also allowed me then to to uh, anticipate any criticisms of the article and 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 therefore that it would go out as a, a much broader and more acceptable idea um, but that of course uh, that practice by me is a bit a sleight of hand in a way but it speaks to how easily the peer review process can be misused and I think that the um, part of it came um, with two things one was in Increasing specialization, that the uh, group of people that uh, became uh, qualified to peer review narrowed. And um, even though um, peer review uh, is done without the names of the reviewers being out there, and I happen to think that's part of the problem, um, you, you could uh, get an article to review, but because the, the field was so small, you knew who had written it. And, um, and therefore, it was very easy to, to take control. But so the, the specialization issue, the other is that um, uh, the um, control of publishing and and um, that became a, a difficulty because academic journals um, developed this peer review process, and, the, and as as part of the publishing uh, angle, and, and um, that became uh, exploited. And I I realized that when I spoke, focused specifically on climate science, I realized that, but. Um, I became very suspicious when uh, the people at the Climatic Research Unit started uh, saying, well, you know, that person doesn't have peer-reviewed articles. 
uh, it became a, a weapon rather than um, uh, what it was originally intended for, a device to ensure uh, a wide uh, ideas and that ideas that, that had some logic to them. So what, what it started out as a good idea gradually became perverted and uh, misused. That, that's, that's within the academic world, but, but the idea of peer review goes beyond that. Gavin, what has been your experience in the publishing of 1421 and 1434? I realize that they're New York Times bestsellers. They've been around for years, and it took off. But you have your own experience with this. Well, Kim, my experience, which is a very small uh, part of history, uh, is that peer review is an absolute disaster for, as far as historians are concerned. Um, to, to give an example, I, I've just, in fact, sponsored uh, a number of talks at the Royal Geographical Society in London at which Emeritus Professor John Sorensen and Emeritus Professor Carl Johannesson uh, spoke or gave talks. Now, they're two historians who have specialized over the last 50 years in... Uh, outlining the history of contact between the old world and the new from 7000 BC onwards. Uh, they, um, Sorensen has published a book with Martin Raich, Pre-Columbian Contact Across the Oceans, um, which lists out no less than 5,000 uh, voyages between the old world and the new before Columbus. And scholars can read this enormous tome, which is 1,200 pages long. Uh, he and Johannesson have collaborated in uh, a book about uh, pre-Columbian contact across the oceans as evidence in the distribution of plants. Now, these two very learned professors get absolutely nowhere. They, couldn't, they can't get a commercial publisher to, to publish their books. Uh, the reason being that they're absolutely frozen out, as far as I can see, of the academic world um, because they challenge the notion that Columbus discovered America. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the concept that Columbus discovered America is absolutely ridiculous. He had maps. He accepts the fact he had maps. They came from an Italian called Toscanelli, and they were copies of Chinese maps. And the contract which Columbus signed with the King of Spain, uh, Ferdinand, uh, wasn't anything about going to China. It was that he was to become viceroy on behalf of King Ferdinand of the land the other side of the ocean. So if you've got maps of the place you're going to sail to and you've got a contract saying you're going to be viceroy of the place when you get there, how on earth can you say that you've discovered the place? And in fact, he never did argue he'd discovered the place. So the whole concept of Columbus discovering America is absolutely ridiculous, and it's only there because it's buttressed by the fact that anyone who challenges it gets frozen out um, by the peer review historians who stick to the ridiculous assertion that he did discover America. So I think it's an it's absolute catastrophe. It, it muzzles historians. Uh, it prevents the truth being put out for people to learn, and as a result, we have history as it's currently taught is just one long fairy story. Kim, can I support and, and um, comment on on uh, Gavin's uh, assertion? Yeah, go ahead. That his, his, go ahead. Well, that his his uh, experience is just a very small part of history. In fact, I would argue that it's a much larger part of what has been going on. I worked with um, a, a Sam Balfe, who was uh, one of the youngest uh, cabinet ministers here in British Columbia, and and became very very interested in the visit visits to the west coast of, of British Columbia here, or Canada, and um, uh, he was particularly interested in the voyage of Sir Francis Drake, yes. and, and, uh, and of course, he ran headlong into exactly what Gavin is talking about with regard to Columbus.